Happy Thanksgiving. Hoping everybody is having a good holiday. We're just going to see if a few people uh, flow in. Today we're talking about uh, zero trust neck uh, architecture. It's an old topic. I think it's morphing into uh, some new things. Some new things and some good things. So like I said, once again, we're waiting to see who flows in here. Of course, since I'm, since I'm a NIST guy, I always start off with the NIST documentation. Like I said, we're just going to wait for a little bit and see who flows in here. Hope everybody's having a great holiday. I think I'm going to be like everybody else. So of course, my standard New Year's, I'm going to need to uh, get on a diet and lose a little weight. So once again, we're about to start. I'm just doing a few housekeeping duties in here. I'm still getting the hang of actually going live. I'm actually enjoying it though, but still getting the hang of it. Hmm. Well, like I said, let's get started. I was, like I said, just doing a few housekeeping items. Let's get started. Once again, um, I'm going to go over zero trust architecture. It's super hot. I've seen a couple people uh, liking some stuff on LinkedIn for the zero trust. So let's get started. Uh, since I'm a NIST guy, I always start off with the NIST documentation. Uh, networking is usually under access control, which is the NIST family AC. To be more descriptive, it's under AC4, Information Flow Enforcement. We'll just read the discussion at a high level. Information flow control regulates where information can travel within a system and between systems in contrast to who is allowed to access the information without regards from subsequent access to that information. Flow control restricts including blocking external traffic Claims to be from within the organization, keeping export control information from being transmitted and declared to the internet, restrict web requests that are not from the internal web server or proxy server, limiting information transfer between organization based on data structures or context. Transferring information between organization may require an agreement between how the information is flowed and enforced. I'll skip down. Organization commonly empl employ information flow control policies, enforcement mechanisms to control the flow of information between designated source and destination within between the connected systems. Uh, usually uh, filtered in or inspection mechanisms, hardware, firmware, soft comp software components that are critical to the information flow. One of the basic uh, things for controlling information flow, and of course I have this in the description box, is your standard firewall, All right? So you're gonna do egress and ingress, which is using outflow and inflows. Usually you put firewall rules in to control that flow, even between two subnets, we're saying only this device can talk to that device, All right? And for each one of those, firewall rules there should be some documentation on why did you create that rule in the firewall right one of my main jobs is federal compliance so far the for that compliance is this firewall rule between this company and that company where's your system agreement where's your internal control stating why you created that firewall rule right we were sending this rule sending information to the bank 
it was granted by the system owner, right, and the bank. So there should be an agreement stating file layout, uh, frequency of delivery of the files, and some internal validation, right? You got your bank number, routing number, encryption, what uh, is your limit on per check, what's your limit for a batch, right? That all should be written up in your system level agreement, right? So once again, that'll be in your NIST documentation, and I'll put the new NIST 800-53R5, I'll put the link in there. So once again, we're talking about zero trust architecture. So we're actually gonna look at a quick abstract from Microsoft. But remember, when you're talking about zero trust architecture, that's actually a framework, right? So you can, you can enforce zero trust using Microsoft, uh, Cisco's got a version using the ACI, VMware's got a version using Tectration, tech, tech so there's different ways to do zero trust. And a lot of vendors are actually jumping on the bandwagon, right? So if there's money to make, you got to be careful because everybody's got a zero trust firewall, zero trust tech tracing for your workloads, your, uh, your firewall rules. And we're going to talk in there micro segmentation where basically it's a firewall rule just for that device. And we'll dig a little more in there, right? So you got to remember... Zero trust architecture is a framework. There's many ways to actually make that happen. All right. Once again, I'll put this link into the zero trust maturity level. Um, this abstract shares principles for implementing a zero trust security model and a maturity model to help access your zero trust readiness and plan your implementation journey. While every, while every organization is different, each journey will be unique. And we hope Microsoft Zero Trust Maturity Model will expedite your process. All right, uh, cloud applications and mobile workforce has redefined the security perimeter. Employees are bringing their own devices and working remotely. Data is accessed outside the corporate network and shared in external collaborations such as partners, vendors, corporate applications, or data moving on premises to hybrid and cloud environments. So in the old days, it used to be one perimeter wall. Now, since we got, especially during COVID, people working from home, we're doing stuff in Azure, Amazon, and Google. So now the perimeter is just not your company, right? Your perimeter is all of that, right? So now a lot of people said, really, is there a perimeter anymore, right? So, so that's it. So guiding principles from Microsoft is verify explic explicitly, we just talked about that, right? Use least privilege access and assume a breach, right? So when you say assume a breach, we believe every device, every server, every cloud uh, API is hacked or breached, right? Or those are potential uh, pain points for us that actually could hack our organization or get our organization in trouble. So when you say assume a breach, right? Assume that device has already been compromised, right? So if that device is compromised and it gets in your network, what other layers of security will prevent that um, infection from rippling through your organization, right? That's one thing about zero trust. It used to be once you get in the perimeter, we would trust you. Now, even if you're in the perimeter, we still don't trust you. I like that. That's kind of my nature. I'm not very trusting. Right. Building trust in your organization, identities, where, whether they represent people, service, or IoT devices. Devices, identity has been granted to the resource. Data can flow through a variety of different devices. IoT devices, smartphones, bring your own devices. Application, data, infrastructure, and networking. Zero trust across the digital estate. So now we got the identities, corporate devices there and there. You got your device inventory, multi-factor, username risk. So one of the big deals, and we'll delve down into that, is all your corporate devices should be identified, right? Then what are your unmanaged devices? Then since we believe everything is compromised, when that device connects to your corporate network, we usually give that device a health score and zero trust, 
right? So when you take your corporate laptop and you sign into the organization, the organization should see is the virus uh, software up to date? Is the malware software up to date? Did somebody disable something in the BIOS, right? And I got some short videos, right? So those components on that device, even bring your own device, should give it a health score. Depending on that health score would tell us what resources should we make available to that device with that particular health score, right? So if you're an accountant and you work from home and for some reason you don't have the proper malware device and your device comes up with a health score, a health score of 30%, we probably are not going to let you work on the accounting system until we figure out what's up with your laptop or your corporate device. Now, we'll let you go read the employee handbook, right, at a 30%, but we won't let you get in the back end uh, resources of that organization because that data will be classified as high. And for a high classification, your health of your device needs to be at a 80, 90, or even 100%. And once again, I'm about to show some videos on that. And the thing, too, is <clears throat> Microsoft did a maturity model, right? Traditional set up of a firewall or premise identity with static rules and some SSOs, limited visibility into device compliance in the cloud, All right? That's traditional. What's advanced? Advanced is a hybrid identity, identity finely tuned access policies or uh, granted access data apps and network. Devices are registered and compliant to IT security policies once again, devices are registered and compliant to IT securities. Networks are being segmented and cloud threats or protection are in place. Then the optimal, which is the next level, highest level, zero trust is cloud identity in real time analysis, analysis, dynamically gate access to application workloads, network and data. Then access decisions are governed by cloud security policy engine and sharing is secure with encryption and tracking. Trust has been removed from the network entirely. Micro cloud perimeter, micro seg segmentation and encryption are in place. Automatic threat detection and response are implemented. Right. So now your your um, optimal is we got the threat monitoring in there, which is machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, the network is learning where you work at. So if you do ninety percent of your work in in Chicago or Florida, and all of a sudden you end up in Spain, right? Your your score is going to be a little different. Like this person never worked in Spain before, so we're actually going to quarantine their actual work device until we figure out why they're in Spain, right? That's optimal, right? So we're learning the behavior of your network and taking that into account. So we're actually going to drill down a little more, and we'll look at each one of these in more detail traditional, advanced, and optimal, right? And once again, these are being the um, description of it so you can have it. The weird thing is I do a lot of assessments. Most companies and middle companies are barely in traditional. They're not even setting up the traditional firewalls and infrastructure correct. So now we're trying to go traditional and jump all the way to optimal. Right, so, so smaller clients and, and smaller entities and smaller government organizations, right? You should go to traditional, work your way to advanced, then get to optimal. So once again, I'm about to show this quick, short video and we're gonna de delve into more detail uh, shortly. Once again, uh, Zero Trust is a framework. So I'm, I'm gonna show everything from VMware to Microsoft to Juniper, right? So any of these vendors can help you get closer to zero trust, right? We're going from traditional to advanced to optimal. So let's hear what uh, Cisco's version is of what is zero trust. With billions of connected IoT devices and thousands of... Hi again, it's Raj. Since Adam and I... Get that over there. It's Let me see what I can do today. Let's get that over there. Check the clients.
Sorry about that. Still working on getting a video over there. Let's see. With billions of connected IoT devices and... Fair use, so let's get that rolling. Billions of connected IoT devices and thousands of cloud applications, enterprise security is losing visibility into and control over who and what is accessing their data. Companies need to be agile. And employees, contractors, vendors, they need to get work done, wherever they might be, and on whatever device they're using. But security teams may wonder, are my users who they say they are? And are their devices secure? Should these apps be talking to each other? How do I know who and what to trust? The answer is simple. Start at zero. You see, traditional security is based on location, but the zero trust philosophy takes a different approach, establishing and verifying trust for every access request, no matter where it comes from. With this method, trust isn't fixed. It evolves with your business, ensuring only the right users and devices get access when they need it, and that threats don't move across your network. But not all zero trust models are created equally. There's three key components that define your IT ecosystem. Duo security protects your workforce, establishing trust for people and their devices, accessing your apps from anywhere. Tetration protects your workloads, securing all connections within your applications across data centers and the multi-cloud. Finally, SD access segments your workplace, securing user and device connections across your network, including IoT. While some enterprise security offerings only focus on one component of your ecosystem, Cisco Zero Trust is a comprehensive solution. Over time, levels of trust dynamically adjust to address new levels of risk. Our three-step methodology ensures trust over time by establishing trust, enforcing trust-based access, and continuously verifying trust. And if you're worried about third-party integrations, don't be. Cisco Zero Trust extends trust to an unrivaled amount of technology and security partnerships as well as other Cisco offerings to provide more visibility and policy enforcement, automation, and a reduced attack surface across your entire IT ecosystem. Zero Trust isn't simply a product, it's a philosophy and a framework. And for enterprise-level Zero Trust security to be effective, it needs to protect your workforce, workloads, and workplace. See how Cisco is simplifying the journey to zero trust. Visit cisco.com slash go slash zero dash trust. So that's um, Cisco's um, thoughts on zero trust at a high level. Like I said, uh, once again, that was just the overview of that and we're gonna keep digging down. Let me see. Make that bigger, okay. So when you're talking about a traditional architecture setup for a company, standard three tier, that's Amazon, but any uh Big company, small company, usually you have your web server, application server, database three tier architecture, right? So from a traditional standpoint, right, we have static firewall rules saying what ports are open from the internet to your web server, what ports are open from your web server to your application server, what ports are open from your your database to your application server. So in the standard, I'm a Java guy. Um, I've done Java off and on for 10 years. I'm hoping to get back to that. I actually miss programming. But um, if you run an Apache, which is a standard web server app for Java, it's gonna be 80 open and uh, 443, of course, which is SSL. From the So from this low web application load balancer, to that web server app, the only ports are probably gonna be open are gonna be 80, 443. Of course, we gotta work on it, 22, which is SSH. Um, depending on how we're doing our um, authentication and authorization, if we have a single sign-on server using Active Directory, right, those ports will be open. 
So from the web server, there's probably going to be probably eight to 10 point ports open, right? So there's over 65,000 ports that can be open. So when you have 65,000 ports over, that's what they said on the Cisco. Let's make our attack surface small, right? So instead of having 65,000 ports open, we're going to have 10, right? So since those only ports open, those only ports people can attack us on. So if we only have 10 ports, right, we can monitor, track, sim, log everything because we're only looking at 10 ports getting to the web server. Right, so from a traditional traditional set. Then going from the uh, Apache to a standard Tomcat or NGX, uh, Tomcat, usually you're going to have 8080 open, 8081 open on this server. Um, then once again, you have four or five more ports to Get your updates on the server, 22 to SSH in and work on it. Both of these, um, since I'm a Linux guy, of course, we'll be running Linux on those boxes. So we have, once again, eight or 10 ports open on our application server. Uh, then once again, for the database, if you're doing Oracle or MySQL, Oracle's 1529, 1526. So we have those couple ports open. OEM for their management console, and once again, SSH to work on it. So to, so each one of these layers, we would have only certain firewall rules open, right? But the thing we're missing in traditional is the firewall rules we're usually putting in are only going to handle east, I mean, I'm sorry, north and south traffic, right? So if I get a virus on this web server here, where that three is, I can automatically talk on that VLAN to the other server. So if I get ransomware on three, nine times out of ten, it's going to just move over to the next web server. So part of zero trust is even between my web servers, I got firewall rules in between those. And we'll talk about it. That's called micro segmentation. And what would that look like in zero trust? But let's go back to traditional. But traditionally, what I would do is since I'm running Linux, I would just have IP tables, which is a built-in firewall for Linux. And I wouldn't let these two Linux web servers talk to each other. Right? So I would say only thing could talk to these, this web server is this load balancer, right? With those ports open to talk to it, SSH. But I wouldn't let any other web server talk to each individual other web server. So if I got a virus on one, the only way it could actually uh, migrate to the other one, it would actually have to go to our admin box, uh, infect that. Right, because the admin box can talk to every web server on there, but it can jump be between that web server and, and the next web server, right? And we're digging more of that, right? So that's east and west traffic. So I would have IP tables set up, and I would say only let the load balancer and the, the same 10 web servers and SSH, I wouldn't let a web server talk to another web server, right? So even in a traditional uh, architecture, I still could block east and west traffic. Right, but now right, it gets a little more difficult because um, I work on some of my clients. They have 70 web servers. So right now, so now we got to maintain 70 IP tables for each web server. How do we do that? How do we log in and how we keep track of it? Right, so and I think that's what Zero Trust is going to help you with the east and west traffic because when you get a virus inside your organization, especially uh, ransomware, it's, it easily moves east and west in your traffic because usually you don't have firewalls blocking east and west. Traffic usually just have firewalls blocking north and south. So um, once again, I keep telling you I'm a NIST guy. NIST has special publications that they put out for um, different projects, web server, app server. And actually they have NIST special publication 800 207, I think it just came out. I know it just came out this year. It came out in August 2020. So that means the government is really signing off into the Zero Trust. They're actually recommending it to some of the uh, uh, government agencies. Some of the big agencies are starting to push it, a la HIPAA, OSHA, IRS, Health and Hospital. So they're actually pushing zero trust, right? Because that's the next uh, big thing in um, networking. So we're just going to go through this document at high level. It's 59 pages. 
Once again, I have this link in the description. So part of my job as a security architecture, security compliance, and I do review um, setups from organization that gives uh, send information into this organization I work, I have to review network architecture and network uh, diagrams, network layouts. So I'm trying to keep up with the latest technology. So if somebody had say they have a zero trust architecture, I need to understand that at a high level so I can do an assessment of it, right? And as we go through, there's some things about the zero trust architecture that I'm gonna reach out to some vendors and ask how they're securing this from a, a government uh, federal compliance. So let's, uh, let's start. So table of contents, they talk about the history. We'll skip that. Zero trust basics. We kind of learned that from actually the Cisco presentation. The logical components of a zero trust architecture, right? The deployment scenario and use cases of it. The threats associated with a zero trust architecture. Just because you got a zero trust architecture, there's still threats that apply to that architecture, right? So whatever you come up with, the bad guys are going to figure a way to, to attack it, right? But zero trust, I believe, is more secure, uh, more flexible, easier to work with vendors, but there are uh, attackers and uh, threats to that architecture. Zero trust architecture, possible interaction with existing federal guidance. Once again, I'm this, so they talk about a zero trust uh, talk with the NIST risk management framework, with the NIST privacy framework, with the trusted interconnection, and um, and cloud smart and federal data strategies. Right, these are some things the federal government already already has in place. Right, so how does zero trust fold into coordinate and work with all the other frameworks that the government has? Right, migrating to a zero trust framework framework. Pure zero trust, a hybrid uh, ZTA, and a perimeter-based architecture. Um, I think 99% of people are going to have a hybrid because we looked at the standard architecture for a three-tier. So a lot of people are going to take their perimeter base and kind of meld it and meld it into a hybrid uh, zero trust architecture before they get to a pure one. Right. So, and we look at some of the figures: zero trust access. Core device agent policies. You know, like I said, we'll look at it. So, from the introduction, a typical enterprise infrastructure has grown increasingly complex. A single enterprise may operate several internal networks, remote office, and own local infrastructure, remote and mobile individuals, and cloud services. This complexity has outstripped the legacy method of perimeter based network security as there is no singly easily identified perimeter for the enterprise. Perimeter-based network has also been shown to be insufficient since once the attacker breached the perimeter, further, further lateral movement is unhindered. That's what we're going through on the web server, right? When we start talking about east and west traffic, once you get in the perimeter, you can easily move east and west. So complex enterprise has led to development of a new model for cybersecurity known as zero trust. Zero trust approach is primarily focused on data and service protection, but it can be and should be expanded to all enterprise assets such as devices, infrastructure, component, and application, and cloud security, subjects, end users, application, non-human entities. Uh, like I said, we're going to skip around. Um, we're not going to talk about the history. I'm going to look at the structure of the document. Zero Trust Basics. Zero Trust is a cybersecurity paradigm focused on a resource protection and the premises that trust is never granted implicitly but must be continually evaluated. Zero Trust Architecture is an end-to-end -end approach to enterprise resources and data security that encompasses identity, person, and non-person identities. Credentials, access management, operation endpoint and host environments, and their interconnection infrastructure. The oper operated definition of zero trust architecture is as following. Zero trust provides a collection of concepts, ideas designed to minimize uncertainty 
and enforcing accurate lease privileges per request access decision and information system and service in the face of network view that's compromised. Service in the face of a network view that's compromised. Zero Trust Architecture is an enterprise cybersecurity plan that utilizes zero trust concepts and encompass components relationship, workflow planning, access policies, Therefore, Zero Trust Enterprise is a network infrastructure, physical and virtual, and optional, I'm sorry, operational policies that are in place for enterprise as a product of Zero Trust Architecture Plan. Right, so one of the uh, key factors in there is, right, the network is viewed as compromised. Right, so like we talked about, each one of those devices is conceived as a threat, and if it's already compromised and it's on your network, how do you limit the damages? How do you sandbox it? How do you say it's not permitted to attach to something even though it's compromised and inside your network? All right, so once again, we're gonna jump around. So this shows you your untrust, untrusted zone. You get your policy decision, your policy enforcement point, right, which is what is your authentication? What's your authorization? What is the health of your device and inside your policies? When we have that figured out, what policies in, initiates to you getting into your system? Basically, you know, we delve down into the tenets of zero trust. All data sources and computer uh, services are considered resources. A network may be comp composed of multiple classes of devices. The network may also be a small footprint of devices that send data to aggregate software, software as a service and systems. All communication is secure regardless of network location. So even though it's behind the firewall, all that traffic should be encrypted, right? So even though your application to your database is behind your firewall, it's three levels deep, Inside your VLANs, we assume everything is compromised. So if we assume your application server's compromised, that's why we're going to encrypt that traffic. So even if there's malware or something listening on that um, server, if that data is encrypted, the malware or um, entity or hacker wouldn't be able to see the information because everything on that server is encrypted, right? Our communication is secure regardless of network location. Access to individual enterprise resources granted on a per session basis. Trust in a request is evaluated before the access is granted. Access should be granted with the least privilege needed to complete the task. Right. So even though you logged in, when you log again today, right, we're going to grant it on your per session basis. So what does that mean? That means we're going to take the health of your workstation. So if you got a virus on there last night, when you go to connect, we view the health of your organization, even though you, you got the correct username and password, you got the correct MFA device. But when you logged into that server, we assume that that device is compromised. So if your health of your, your uh, data is only 30%, even though you have all the correct credentials, we still won't let you connect to that, to that database. What is up, Keep It Techie? What is up, uh, CL? Thanks for joining me. I'm just um, going through Zero Chess Network at a high level. Um, so once again, you, when you log in, individual enterprise resource, which is your phone, laptop, or device, is granted on a per session basis. Right? Four for that is access to resources determined by dynamic policy, including an observable state to the client identity, application service, request asset, may include other behavior and environment attributes. An organization protects resources by defining what resources it has, what its members are, what access to the resource for zero trust client identity, including the user account, on any associated attribute, attribute by the enterprise to the account or artifacts or automated to the task. These rules attributed are based on the needs of the business process and the level. So when they talk about the rules, what is the rules of your device? 
So we were talking about, okay, even though I have the username and password and I got the MFA for that device, I might not let you hook into my network. Why? You work in California. Why is this device coming in from Spain? So that other attribute could be location or time. Like I know Keep It Tech, he's a big time uh, DBA. He might not work 3 a.m. 99% of the time. All of a sudden, he's logging in at 3 a.m. So if that's unusual, even though he has credentials, I might not let him work at 3 a.m. because that seems unusual, right? So I might block Keep It Techie because he usually doesn't work at 3 a.m. You know, Pacific Central time. So then the question is, if he needs to work that un normal, unusual time, right? He would have to put in a request into his boss. We would tell the system, hey, Keep It Techie's planning to work on 3 a.m. That's not normal, but let him work, right? So then that's us granting him access. Well, in the past is if you have username, password, and MFA credentials, he could work. But now we're taking the uh, the unique uh, credentials and system habits of people working in their system. So zero trust is taken out in habits. What's up, Melvin? Welcome to my uh, weird computer talk for today. So we're talking about zero trust network. So we just kind of um, walking through. The enterprise monitors and measures the integrity and security posture of all the own and associated assets. No assets is inherently trusted. The enterprise evaluates the security posture of all assets. Implementing ZTA should be continuous diagnostics, CDM, or similar system or monitor state of device. That's what we were talking about, right? So if you got a phone, a laptop, what is that device, right? Is that a corporate-owned device or is that your personal device? Right, so I work for a government entity. We don't let people use their personal devices to come in. Why don't we let people use their personal device? I don't know if you got the proper um, virus protection. I don't know if you got the proper malware. I don't know if your VPN is up to date. Right, so those are things you talk about when you talk about the integrity and security posture of all the owned uh, assets and associates. All resource and authentications and authorizations are dynamically and strictly enforced before access is allowed. The constant cycle of obtaining access, scanning, and accessing threats, adapting, continue reevaluating, trusting, and a zero trust architecture would be expected to have identity, credentials, access management systems in place. This includes multi factor authentications, like we talked about time based new resource requested, resource uh, modification, anomaly subject activity, right? So that's where we have our dynamic uh, infrastructure that can see what is the basis of our network and what is normally happening on our network, right? So if there's anything abnormal, there's artificial intelligence and machine learning built in to this network to figure out, hey, that's abnormal. We should block it, right? The enterprise collects as much information as possible about the current state of the asset, network infrastructure, communication, and use it to improve security posture. So once again, we got machine learning. We can figure out 99% of the time when you work, what's your habits? Do you just work eight to five? Do you work at night? You're an accountant. Why is an accountant going into the manufacturing system, right? Why is a manufacturing person going to the accounting system, right? Is the manufacturing person trying to steal, right? Even though they're in the network, they're in a company, there's some systems that they shouldn't be able to have access to, right? So now, nine times out of 10, that manufacturing person could try to log on to the accounting system. He probably wouldn't have the username and password, right? But he could try to brute force it. He could try to attack it with a zero trust architecture, it wouldn't even let that manufacturing person even get to that system. It will block them so that the username and password wouldn't even come up, even if they had it good. I hope everybody had a great Thanksgiving and making progress. And so here, I'm going to play another video. Once again, I know a lot of people join us. This is kind of a high-level talk. Zero trust is a framework. What does that mean? That means you could do zero trust with Cisco, Juniper, uh, I'm going to play a couple of Microsoft videos. You can do that with a lot of different technologies, right? So when we talk about zero trust as part of a network for a corporation, it's a framework, 
Right. Um, nine times out of ten, like I said, Cisco is the big gorilla in that organization. So I play Cisco. Now we're going to look at uh, Zero Trust uh, Security Defined um, Network. The network perimeter used to be a well-defined demarcation between what we considered trusted and untrusted networks. A firewall typically sat at the edge of the network to block or allow traffic based on static policies. Insider users were typically given a greater level of trust to critical resources because it was assumed that they could be trusted. But business migration to the cloud, advanced persistent threats, and a mobile workforce has made the perimeter more fluid than ever. And just as our threats and networks have evolved, so must our defense models. Zero Trust Security is an architecture for today's networks. New technologies like software defined perimeter have finally brought the concept into reality. I'm Andy with the CISO Perspective and today we're going to look at accomplishing zero trust security using SDP. Zero trust is a security model in which we throw out the idea of trusting anyone or anything based on where they sit on the network. Instead, every single connection attempt is verified. Until trust can be established, resources are completely hidden from the network, leaving unauthorized users and devices segmented from even seeing anything else on the network. Verification involves a human and machine element before trust can be established. The human element involves verifying the user is who they say they are through authentication and that they have the permission to the resource they are requesting through authorization. While while this verifies the person, we also need to know that they're coming from a trusted device that has not been compromised, and that's where machine verification comes in. By verifying the machine or device a user is connecting on, we limit the exposure a compromised machine could have to sensitive data and prevent lateral movements across the network. Once trust has been established through the verification process, we now have access to the resource we requested and nothing else. Because zero trust security is built around the concept of need to know, I would only have access to the resource that I need and nothing else until the new request goes through the same process. In a zero trust security model, the network is in a constant dynamic state of verifying users and devices. This means that if a verified user is compromised, the machine verification would fail and their access to the resource would be immediately cut off. An untrusted device is completely shut off from the rest of the network to prevent data exfiltration and lateral movement. Because zero trust security is just a model, there's many products and technologies that can help us get there. A relatively new technology known as Software Defined Perimeter or SDP helps carry out many of the zero trust principles on your network. SDP borrows ideas from SDN in building out the zero trust network and there's three main components you need to know. The SDP client, the controller, and the gateway. The SDP client is usually software installed on the endpoint which handles a wide range of functions, including device verification and tunnel setup to the SDP gateway. The device verification usually includes UBA or EDR features that monitor the endpoint for various behaviors that could be indicative of a compromised machine. Some examples can be things like registry changes, unusual network traffic, and indicators of compromise. The SDP controller functions as a trust broker between the client and the backend resource. The controller ties into your IDM solution to authenticate and check authorization authorization for any given request. The authentication could come in the form of PKI, OpenID, SAML, Active Directory, or many other forms. The controller also carries a CA which sets up an encrypted tunnel between the client to the remote resource. The key thing here is that the controller only provides access for the specific resource a client is requesting and has authorization for. The third component of SDP is a gateway. This grants access to the previously private and unknown resource. This is also the termination point for the TLS connection between the client. Once a gateway confirms with the controller that the client can access a given resource, the connection to the application is allowed. The main difference between an SDP connection and, say, a NAC solution is a NAC usually stops at layer 2. The SDP controller and gateway operate all the way up through layer 7. This means that a user can be authorized to access application A on server 1, but not applications B or C running on that same server. In SDP, an unauthorized user wouldn't even be able to see that there are any other applications running on that server without being authorized first. By comparison, an authorized user in a NAC design can't see anything else on the network which doesn't prevent lateral movement. So let's put it all together and simulate how SDP works. In our example, a user with an SDP client running on their machine clicks on an application in their desktop. This sends out what's called a single packet authorization. The SPA packet includes an encrypted key which the SDP controller uses to identify and authenticate who the user is. An encrypted tunnel is established between the user and the SDP controller using PKI, which a controller then uses for authentication, authorization, and device integrity. The controller then sends the IP information of the SDP client to the 
the STP gateway. This allows the gateway to know ahead of time that it should expect a connection from the STP client. From there, the STP client initiates a TLS connection to the gateway, which then allows a client to run the application through that tunnel. Now, all the while, STP clients and gateways are communicating to the controller and exchanging information. If a client's key is compromised or invalid, its connection is immediately blocked off and all visibility to applications or servers on the network is cut off. If a machine is showing signs of being compromised, it would no longer be considered trusted and also immediately cut off from the network and access to any resources. The entire goal of SDP is to prevent network attacks against applications, but there are several other advantages to using SDP in your network, including confidentiality via encrypted tunnels, DOS protection using TLS anti-DOS tokens in the SDP protocol, location protection, lateral movement, information obfuscation, incident response, segmentation, and quarantining. In security, we're always looking to disrupt the kill chain of an attacker by implementing multiple layers of security. If you saw my last video titled Breaking the Kill Chain, you'll immediately notice that the zero trust and STP models can severely disrupt an attack in multiple layers of the kill chain. Zero trust does not reveal any information about the network or its resources without first going through the verification process. This limits the information an attacker can grab during the reconnaissance phase. The dynamic nature of constantly verifying the machine using the STP client can detect unusual activities during the installation and command and control phase. And of course, the need to know principles applied throughout this entire zero trust model limits what an attacker can do during the actions on objectives phase. So that does it for this video, you guys, and I hope everyone found it informative. I will be launching the CISOperspective.com very soon where you can send in your cyber. So he walked over to the back end server process and what we just went over, he did that for the back end. So we're going to skip down the part he, I think, skipped over. I will dig down into that is the actual uh, workstation. So he talked about the back end. So once again, this is a Windows 10 device. So when you boot up a Windows 10 device, if you look at it, the device attestation means when you boot it up and you got the code registry, the secure boot, uh, vulnerability assessment, antivirus, all that stuff is on your Windows 10 workstation. But if you look here, device health signal goes up to the Windows Defender ATP for th advanced threat protection. The machine risk level is like we talked about. The Windows 10 is checking the health of your actual laptop or your desktop. Right, then the device compliance actually goes to Active Director and says, once again, does he have the right virus protection? Does he have the right malware? Does he have the right vulnerability assessment? Does this user, is he actually using his corporate Windows 10 device? Right, because in there we have a key, an encryption key, so we know what device you're signing in. Is he signing in with corporate equipment? Does this corporate equipment have all the Windows policy it should have before we let it sign into our Azure Active Directory or our corporate Active Directory, right? That video talked about the back end, but like we talked about, what is the health of your machine when you log in? So once again, if you have a virus on that machine, even though you have the right credentials and the correct MFA, we're not going to let you sign on the back end and do any work until we get your... Um, your laptop or your iPad or your corporate phone, right? Because there's MDMs for corporate phones to check their devices. So we need to get the a health signature for your device before we actually let you work, right? And when, um, so once again, we're gonna, um, then two is using micro segmentation, right? In an enterprise, choose to implement or place an individual corp group or resource in a unique network segment protected by a gateway security component. So, so in this video, that's what he was talking about. Those individuals appointment was micro segmentation in those networks and part of that kill chain. Then the 312 was also what he was talking about. So um, he did a good job in the video. What is the software divine parameters for a, sec for a secure network? So I'm about to play another uh, Windows video talking about Windows Defenders, ATP, how, to, how it actually secures your um, laptop. 
When it comes to cybersecurity, you need every available resource to keep your data safe and your manager off your back. Meet Brady. He's his company's cybersecurity administrator. Threats keep hitting his endpoints, and he's ready for a better approach. He decides to onboard his machines to Windows Defender ATP. Once initiated, he sees through Windows Secure Score. So if you see that's 613 out of 1,000. So if that person logged into our network with that score, what will we give them access to? What will we block them for? And what will we let them do, right? So that Windows ATP gives you a score, all right? So some of that stuff, you can see some of that stuff he can fit remotely, but if none of that stuff was fixed, what's, what level of score would, would, would you need to have before we let you actually log into our network? This is a super... That many of the built-in security controls are not configured. He uses the provided recommendations to improve his security posture. He uses the centralized configuration in Microsoft Intune to customize the settings. After a few adjustments, the security score is at a safe level. Brady's manager alerts him to a new cyber threat that's compromising data centers worldwide. He quickly jumps into action. He goes to his Windows Defender ATP Power BI report to see how exposed he is to this new threat. He looks for the specific CVE, and most machines have already received the emergency outbreak update. He sees that his Windows 10 machines have been updated, but some legacy machines have not received the emergency push. He configures his settings and updates the legacy machines. When Brady meets with his management, he has nothing but good news and a high security score to report. Improve your security posture. Windows Defender ATP. I love how these uh, presentation, everything always end up great in the end, right? Everybody's cooling in. But the big deal in that was the ATP secure. When that um, device, laptop, phone um, connected, it gave it an initial score, right? So with that score now, we can do, like we were talking about, the next level, past traditional is, I know the health of your device, and I can make decisions from the health of your device. In the old way, we would be like, hey, if you got your username and password, and you got your MFA, we're going to let you log in. We really wasn't really looking at the health of your device. We would look at a couple high-level things, like um, they got the virus protection, and they got a couple GPOs. They're good, but now they're looking at, if you saw from that video, you're looking at hundreds of things on that laptop to figure out the health of it. Right, and that's when you get to zero trust. That's a high level complexity that zero trust is bringing in, right? It's just not monolithic. If I got a machine and password, I can work right now. It's like, okay, machine, password, and the health of my device. Um, I'm skipping these because these kind of went over in that device. Um, Device application sandboxes is a, a variation of the agent gateway deployment model. It's better application or process running in a compartmentalized assets. So when he was doing that self divine network, remember when he was going through the kill chain, if there was an application or device or a program didn't look right, it would sandbox it, right? So the application couldn't, run, couldn't get out of the sandbox because we believe the application had malware or virus, right? So we would sandbox it. So the Zero Trust Network would actually sandbox it app. And in the um, video, he was talking about that application would be quarantined. Once again, this is the NIST document 800-207. I'm going to post it in the uh, description. It actually walks through how do you come up with setting up a Zero Trust architecture. And, and I think they walk through is when you log in, what is your access request? What is the subject database and history? Is that asset even in our database? What resource and policy requirements? What in threat intelligence and logs? So when you looked at the uh, Microsoft uh, ATP, it's looking at threat intelligence and logs for the devices to figure out if that device was actually hacked. So access requests is a request from the subject resource requesting to primary information. Subject databases, this is who's that are requesting access, human or process of the enterprise and collaborators, and uh, subject attribute privileges assigned. 
these subject attributes from the basis of the policy and resource. So inside Active Directory, in there it tells you what I should have access to and they call it subject. What, what is my level of security and what databases and um, programs should I be able to get into? The access database and observables are stored. This is the database that contain known status of each enterprise owned and possibly known non enterprise. Bring your own devices, assets, physically and virtually to some extent. This is compared to the observable state. So when you log in, right, we're going to see is this your corporate asset? If it's your corporate asset, we know the level of security that that corporate asset should be at, right, before it logs on. Once again, resource requirements, policies, complements the user ID and attributes to define the minimal requirements for access to that resource. Um, insurance levels, such as MFA, network location, denies access from overseas IP addresses, uh, data sensitivity, requests from the assets configuration. So if you're trying to get something like a social security number or some intellectual property and, you, and you're overseas, the zero, uh, zero trust network would block you from getting to the asset because you're overseas. Then threat intelligence, we just looked at the Microsoft ATP. This is the information feed or feeds about the general threats and active malware on the internet. This could be included in specific information about the communication seen on the device that may be suspect, such as queries, malware commands, or control nodes. So when you talk about Microsoft, uh, Cisco, VMware, they have threat intelligence baked into their software so you can see what threats are known in there, right? Then once again, that will tell you the, the health of your device. And that goes both ways. You can have a good um, PC logging into your backend database. It's going to take the health of your databases, your app server, and web server. If it thinks one of those web servers are compromised, and you have a good health in your uh, PC, it's going to quarantine that uh, that server, right? And it's going to send it to the SOC team to figure out what's wrong with it. Is it hacked? Is it true? Or is it a false positive? So when you talk about threat intelligence and a health device, we're talking about on every device on the network, server, web server, phone, and client. So network requirements to support zero trust enterprise assets have basic network connectivity. The enterprise must be distinguishable between what assets are owned or managed by an enterprise and the device current security posture. The enterprise can observe all network traffic. The enterprise resource should not be reachable without accessing the PEP. The PEP is the policies and procedures of what you have rights to and what you do not have rights to. What's up, Andrew? Hello. The data plane and the control planes are log logically separated. The policy engine and the policy administrator communicate on a network. They logically sub separate and they're not, not directly accessible to the enterprise asset and the resource. The enterprise access can reach the PEP component. Only components accessing the policy administrator as part of the business flow. The infrastructure used for, uh, to support zero trust architecture, access decision processes should be made scalable to account for the change. An enterprise essay may not be reachable in certain PP due to policy as uh, observable factors. Uh, so this is talking about segmentation. Uh, which is kind of a Cisco thing. We'll look at another quick video for the for the segmentation. Once again, when we talk about zero zero trust architecture, that's a framework. You can do it with Microsoft. You can do it with Cisco. You can do it with VMware. You can do it with actually just open source system. It's just a framework. Of course, when you buy Cisco, we're about to look at uh, Cisco's version of that. They make it easier. They have all the components. They have all the federal compliance. So this is their version of um, micro segmentation in, in uh, Cisco. It's critical to have traffic flow visibility across your data center to operate, maintain, and run 24-7 with intelligent changes and no scheduled downtimes. 
Cisco Tetration Analytics uses modern, big data technologies to help you understand exactly what's going on in real time to address critical data center operations and security challenges. Application Dependency Mapping Cisco Tetration Analytics gives you a deeper understanding of data center application dependencies to help enable easier migration to a programmable fabric, replication of your applications for disaster recovery, and identification of single points of failure. Automated Policy Recommendation and Simulation By using the Try Before You Apply approach, Automated Policy Recommendation and Simulation gives you a risk-free path to a consistent, whitelist policy-based infrastructure without impacting production traffic. Application Segmentation Cisco Tetration Analytics Automated Policy Enforcement enables customers to realize a consistent segmentation across on-premises data centers and public and private clouds. It also delivers a uniform enforcement for both virtualized and bare metal environments. Policy Export Cisco Tetration Analytics exports policy information that is compatible with different programmatic formats and gives you a rapid transition from a wide open security model to a controlled whitelist policy based security model. Compliance Compliance capabilities of Cisco Tetration Analytics gives you continuous monitoring of application behavior and faster identification of any behavior anomaly or deviation in the communication pattern. Asset Tagging Cisco Tetration Asset Tagging capability uses tags to associate business context to servers, which can be then used to track accurate inventory, associate policies, and visualize traffic. Visualization Gain the unique, powerful capability to search billions of records in less than a second with Cisco Tetration Analytics. You can collect data center network flow information in real time, at line rate, without any sampling. Comprehensive natural language and visual based search queries help find details of known issues and other aberrant behaviors that could go otherwise unnoticed. Issues that are critical to an application owner or to network and operational engineers. Dashboard creation. Cisco Tetration Analytics hardware and software sensors gather comprehensive analytical points of telemetry. This information is thoroughly analyzed and used to create rich informational dashboards that give you critical data points in quick and easy to navigate charts and formats. Users can create their own custom dashboards with queries, filters, and custom display properties to narrow the scope of information to what is relevant for them. Self-monitoring. Cisco Tetration Analytics provides self-monitoring to cluster components that use big data technology and perform analytics including hardware and software sensors for easier cluster management. Cluster self-monitoring eliminates the need for in-house extensive big data technology expertise. Tetration Apps Tetration Apps provide the flexibility to extend the use cases supported. Developers, programmers and data scientists can gain access to the data in the Tetration platform and use their own logic to analyze this data to generate a variety of reports or trigger northbound notification. By combining unsupervised machine learning techniques, behavior analysis, and intelligent algorithms, Cisco Tetration Analytics provides real-time, pervasive visibility into traffic flows within your data center infrastructure to help you meet modern data center operational requirements. 
That's actually Cisco version of micro segmentation. Once again, when you talk about zero trust, it's a framework. Of course, if you have Cisco, it's a ton of money, but if you have it, they obviously makes it easier. So we're gonna talk about threats associated with zero trust. Just because you're in zero trust, there's actually attacks to zero trust. Uh, you still have a denial of service attack or network, network disrupt, disruption. You can still send a ton of packets to the zero trust network and overwhelm it. The cool thing is it shouldn't get deep inside your network, but it still overwhelm your uh, web servers and your outward facing uh, stuff. Stolen credentials are still a problem in zero trust. Attackers can be used by phishing, social engineering. The cool thing with zero trust though is we assume that every device is, is a threat. So we assume that those credentials will get hacked. So even though those th 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 uh, sorry credentials will get hacked, you shouldn't be able to do east and west traffic to elevate those credentials. Um, the visibility of a network, all traffic is inspected and logged on the network and analyzed and identified. So, um, so those are just the standard attacks that are on a network. Uh, zero trust here, we're just talking about it still should work with your NIST risk framework, your NIST privacy framework. Since I do federal work, I do a lot of NIST stuff. So it just lets you know it, it can integrate with all the current frameworks used by the government. So once again, it's talking about migrating. Are you going to have a pure trust architecture? That's probably a no because nobody's starting from scratch. You're having a hybrid where we're talking about a perimeter-based approach, and you're going to meld that with a zero-trust architecture. Uh, like I said, I'm skipping a lot of that. was over when the guy was actually doing the system to find. So once again, we uh, look at the... Uh, this right here is a traditional architecture, three-tier web server, app server, database. So if this web server actually got a virus, you can actually replicate the virus uh, east and west on web server traffic. So you would do a uh, micro-segmentation. Each one of these web servers will be micro-segmented. So if you got a virus on one web server, you, it can automatically jump on the other one. But for me, from a traditional one, and I guess I'll reach out to uh, Keep It Tech is, I would just spin up an IP tables firewall rules on each one of my web servers. So when it was spun up automatically, you would have a, a IP tables firewall built into that Linux box. And I wouldn't let the web servers talk to each other. The web servers would just talk to the load balancer from the internet. Of course, I got an SSH server out here to work on each individual server. Now that server could talk to each individual web server but I wouldn't let the web servers talk to each other. I would just spin up an IP table firewall, which is a built-in firewall inside of, a, inside of Linux. Like I said, I'm a big Linux guy and I use this, so I would just spin up IP table. And um, let's see, I've got a couple more things to show you. Oh, let's see, did I, of course, AWS has their version of uh, zero trust, so I was going to show that. I'm actually going to implement that probably in a couple of weeks and actually see us actually implementing the AWS zero trust. We actually build that actually uh, live and online and actually walk through it um, as another um, video I'm going to do so we can actually see it actually build a zero trust network um, in, up, in AWS from scratch. So here's AWS. And once again, I'm going to have all these in the description. So if you want to go through. So this is the standard network we're looking at. They go web servers, a load balancer, app server, auto scale, down to the database. So down here is their version of zero trust. So they have a wide firewall in red. Uh, then they have the application load balancer. They have a web tier, an app tier, and a database tier. Each one of these tiers, they have a security group. So like they said, is they will lock down each one of those versions. Um, then what they're missing is the micro segmentation inside um, 
AWS. So theoretically, you can actually run Cisco or a VMware inside AWS to give you micro segment, right? To get to that next level of zero trust architecture. Remember, there was traditional, advanced, and optimal, right? So what is the optimal? And we'll look at here, and I'll have this in here. So from Microsoft, they have traditional, advanced, and optimal. So this is your things from your traditional. And here's your, your, your optional. And this is your optimal, right? And these, once again, your zero trust, strong authentication, policy base, micro segmentation, automation, intelligence, AI, and data classification, right? That's optimal. And two is, like I said, next, uh, probably two or three weeks, we're actually going to set that up using this AWS firewall. We're actually set it up. We're actually run um, NetStat and see what ports are open, see what ports we can get to, and see what Zero Trust is all about. Um, like I said, so that's me wrapping it up. I just want to do a high-level version of Zero Trust. I have all these uh, links inside the documentation. I want to appreciate everybody uh, from joining it. Please subscribe and share. Uh, once again, we're actually going to set this up in AWS in two weeks. Then we're going to actually go through and actually, once again, set up in AWS, run that stat, run Wireshark, and actually see what ports are open. We actually um, leak out a password on a web server and see if we have that password and we scan what stuff we can get to and what stuff we can hack it. Once again, this is Professor Black Ops. I hope and everybody have a great holiday, and I'll see you guys later. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it.